It's not uncommon to see developers settle on a more complicated method of storytelling for their games, leaving it up to the community to put the pieces together if they want to see the larger picture at play. Ever since the release of Pony Island, these alternate reality mystery hunts have been the norm for games made by Daniel Mullins. By comparison, Inscription's mystery has come a long way from many of the quickly thrown together puzzles that were secretly made by Mullins after Pony Island's release. So how did the community manage to figure everything out this time to complete the story of Inscription? Before getting on to the ARG, it might be helpful to summarize the in-game story to better understand what's going on, and to help those that may have had some difficulty following events, or maybe you just haven't played the game. The in-game story isn't overly complex, but I have seen some individuals express difficulty piecing it all together and understanding where certain parts fit in to the overall events occurring in and out of the game. We know that things begin in the cabin where it's very quickly established that something is off. We had to continue the game despite never starting a save file, the man conducting everything remains a mystery, some of the cards are talking to us, and all we can do is continue playing along until opportunities present themselves. Continuing our journey across multiple lives and working through the puzzles in the cabin introduces us to more cards such as the Stink Bug and Stuffed Wolf, who begin to coordinate a plan of escape with the player. Helping to direct us through more puzzles, we acquire a magical roll of film, and utilizing an empty camera sitting next to the player on a successful run, one picture later and our captor is gone leaving us free to fully explore the cabin and acquire the original new game button that had been locked away in a back room. But before we can return to the main menu and start a new game, we get introduced to our main character. This is Luke the Lucky Carter, who based on the occasional camera filter that covers the screen and moments of random commentary, appears to be who we're playing as. These recordings establish who Luke is and how his interest in card games led to him discovering written coordinates in a resealed pack of inscription cards. Realizing the coordinates might be nearby him, Luke travels to the location, where he digs up a red floppy disk. After acquiring a floppy disk reader and loading up the contents, a copy of inscription would begin to play on Luke's computer, where presumably we go through Luke's first time playing the game. Leaving these recordings brings us back to the main menu where we can start a new game this time and restore things to their original state. An intro cinematic plays and it's here that we learn about the four scribes that control the world of this game. Grimora, the scribe of the dead, P03, the scribe of technology, Magnificus, the scribe of magics, and a familiar looking face, Leshy, the scribe of beasts. Our mission this time is to defeat all four scribes and replace one of them. But as we progress through this act, it becomes clear that starting a new game didn't exactly return things to normal. The scribes appear to be aware of the events that occurred in Act 1, and it seems clear that all of them are working on their own plans behind the scenes to acquire something while the player makes their way through each area. Furthermore, some of the side characters in this act began talking about looking for corrupted items and mentioning something called the Old Data. Halfway through this act, we're interrupted with a low battery message, and the game will transition back to more recordings from Luke. This time, Luke appears to be more troubled as he begins investigating the odd behavior of the game. This leads to Luke reaching out to GameFuna, the creators of Inscription, while he looks for answers. But upon receiving a reply, not only is Luke threatened with legal action if he doesn't return the game, but a strange woman pays a visit to his house to inquire further if he is actually in possession of a copy of Inscription, leaving Luke unable to focus on his other work as he delves deeper into the mystery of this game. Things transition back to Act 2 and the player is left to defeat the remaining scribes, but upon doing so and returning to the start for one last fight against the scribe the player plans to replace, P03 appears instead and takes control of the game, moving us on to Act 3. Everything appears to be more similar to Act 1 at this point, as P03 forces the player to go through his map so he can usher in something called the Great Transcendence. Once again, players are left with a little information and forced to progress through the game, defeating the uberbot bosses that seem to be trying to take control of various functions in Luke's computer. Speaking of Luke, we're once again interrupted by an error message halfway through, stating the memory card is full before we go back to the final set of recordings from Luke. This time, the videos become a bit strange as more of the recordings are these corrupted errors. 
In the videos that are available, Luke appears to become gradually more distressed as he contacts the woman that sold the original pack of inscription cards that contained the coordinates inside, before he learns that the cards actually belong to the woman's daughter Casey. It's further revealed that Casey had been one of the developers that worked for Game Funa, but had passed away from complications caused by a fire that broke out at the company's offices when she was working late. The final video we see is a late night recording from Luke in his bed, informing anyone that watches it that someone has broken into his house and that he's about to go into another room to get his phone. And as he opens the door, the video cuts out, seemingly leaving his fate unknown. However, two of the error recordings after this do have some footage available. The second to last video briefly shows a hand reaching for a note, while the final error video shows Luke laughing to himself while sitting over a scale and dropping dice as a reenactment of Inscription's card game. After this, it's back to Botopia. P03 does allow the player to stand up and explore his factory, just as Leshy allowed the player to explore his cabin, leaving us to solve puzzles and perform a few simple chores for him. It's during one of these jobs to fix a broken camera that the player encounters the three remaining scribes hiding away in the darkness beneath the factory. Here they make a plan with the player. Continue playing through the game to win, and once the player has won and P03 becomes distracted by his victory, the other scribes will deal with him. We go on to reach the end, and P03 reveals the purpose of his plan. By forcing Luke to play through his game, P03 was able to gain access to Luke's computer through the various abilities of the bosses. With full access obtained, he intends to upload Inscription to the internet so that thousands of copies of the game will exist with him permanently in control. But as he begins uploading, the other scribes make their move and kill P03. With the Great Transcendence stopped, both Leshy and Magnificus are content with the player starting a new game returning to the previous state of the scribes engaging in power struggles for control of everything. But instead, Grimori utilizes P03's access to Luke's files to delete the contents of Inscription. Players can only watch as the scribes say their goodbyes as the game's data begins to be deleted. After a short time spent with each scribe until their deletion, all that seems to be left is the player. But just before reaching the end, it's revealed that the woodcarver has also not been deleted yet and she would leave us with a final warning. All that remains on the disc is the old data, and even though she knows we won't follow her advice, it is recommended that we do not access it. Just as she said, the old data is all that remains ahead, and with no other options, players can only click on it to finish the game. As the old data is opened and the screen glitches out, Luke quickly pulls the disc from his computer while grabbing a nearby hammer, to smash the disc and destroy whatever is on it. In the final moments of the game, we cut to a recording from Luke showing him calling the police regarding whatever he found on the disc, when he's interrupted by the door. He goes to answer it and sees that it's the woman from GameFuna who visited him earlier before this quickly happens. I told you! The main in-game story concludes at this point, but there are still a few pieces of story information that can be obtained from easter eggs. Things such as visiting the Bone Lord in Act 2, or the Mycologist in Act 3, continue to make references to this old data. Furthermore, we can also learn a little bit more about Casey and something called the Carnoffel Code that's responsible for corrupting the game by collecting all the hollow pelts in Act 3. But even after this, we're still left with plenty of questions as to where the old data came from and how did it end up on a disc that Casey was using to create Inscription. With that out of the way, we finally move on to the ARG portion of the story and where the community's hunt began. Everyone was certain that there was more to discover given the mysteries surrounding this game's story, and after combing back over the game, players noticed then the second to last error video from Luke the crumpled piece of paper that someone was reaching for had some writing on it. Pausing the video at the right moment to examine the paper left players with what appeared to be three clues to work with. Mycologist, Perhaps, and Blood Letterbox, each of them spelt with various amounts of leet speak. 
If you're not familiar with what LeetSpeak is, the simplest way to put it is that it's an alternate method of spelling online that replaces letters with numbers or other characters. So letters like the I in mycologist have been replaced with a 1, while the E in perhaps has been replaced with a 3. Everyone would need to keep this in mind for some of the upcoming puzzles. Moving back to the first clue of mycologist, players knew that the mycologist is a character encountered in the game. While nothing stands out about him in the first act, in the second act he has more interactions with the player, requesting they bring him two copies of a card that he will combine into a stronger version. Fulfilling four of his requests would lead to the mycologist granting players a holographic key as a hint to find something in the third act. Progressing to Act 3 and searching for a hidden part of the map would reveal a locked door requiring the key from earlier. Upon entering, players would find themselves in a boss fight against the mycologist. If you defeat him, he'll briefly combine his cards together into this creature with a long string of numbers for its name that he says is a fragment of the old data. Taking this number, users were able to figure out that based upon the final two letters of mycologist being replaced with a 1 and a 2, that they need to use the first 12 numbers to obtain the answer to the first clue. This leaves us with 918-234-489-010 as the first part of our cipher. Now we have our second clue to deal with of, perhaps, with two question marks at the end. This one was actually solved fairly quickly, as it was recognized as a reference to a joke surrounding an item called the Beeper in another game made by Mullins. In Pony Island, the beeper became a joke when, while searching for that game's mysteries, one user reversed a line of audio and it sounded like a voice saying, a beeper perhaps, leading to some members of the community becoming convinced that this was a clue, despite the coincidence of it sounding like that. So the beeper would be a reappearing joke in later games made by Mullins, such as the Hex, and Inscription was no exception. While the beeper never appears in any game made by Mullins due to both the item and its artist not being real, it is referenced in the credits of inscription to Louis Nathas, the in-game president of GameFuna. This would lead users to take another look at the credits for inscription where the beeper had been mentioned. Upon closer inspection, it was noted that while the Sketchfab link credited for the beeper was invalid, there was one part of the URL that seemed relevant. 8339344 question mark question mark The two question marks at the end along with there being seven numbers to match the seven letters in perhaps seem to indicate that users would need to replace the letters in perhaps with these numbers to receive their answer This brings us to our third clue of blood letterbox This one is actually pretty similar to our first clue involving the mycologist First, users would need to visit the Bone Lord in Act 2. He's more hidden away compared to the Mycologist, but if players obtain the two halves of the Oboe card and combine them together while playing, they can receive an item called the Ancient Oboe. Going back to the crypts now allows us to access a lower level to visit the Bone Lord. Talking to him reveals more about his knowledge of the old data and how its existence corrupts the game. Talking to him a second time grants players a familiar looking hollow key, where once again, a locked area of Act 3 will allow players to meet the Bone Lord once more. Before going in though, the game's resolution needs to be adjusted to Letterbox. Upon going inside and talking to the Bone Lord, the game will darken as he tells Luke not to record what he is about to tell him. But before this occurs, users notice that for just a few frames, a code will appear by the Bone Lord reading Bone Lord 666 in Leet Speak. Now that we have all three of our answers, users were left with the question of what to do with this completed cipher from solving all the clues. As it turns out, people had discovered a hidden command line players could access when beginning Act 2. You can actually interrupt the boot up process for Act 2 by hitting Ctrl C on your keyboard to access the console. After experimenting with some commands, by typing cd old underscore data, followed by decode log dot txt, and entering our cipher containing the answers to all the clues, outputs this text. I'll leave it up on screen for anyone that wants to pause and read it, but to summarize what's going on, the text is pieces of conversation individuals are having about a man named Barry Wilkinson, aka Big Year, 
smuggling a disc out of somewhere before returning to the United States, where he is now missing. The people talking also appear to be angry at a Mr. Kaminsky, someone players recognized as one of the death cards in Act 1. Ignoring the fact that some of the context to this conversation seems to be missing for now, if you look closely at the writing, you've probably noticed these letters randomly contained in brackets scattered throughout the text. Once users pulled out everything in brackets and put it together, everyone realized that it was another set of three clues to be solved again. With a new set of clues obtained, it was back to solving more puzzles. First we have SE167BPTRUE. Some users began to guess that SE stood for Special Event, driving players to examine the game files. But after looking through the save files specifically, it actually appeared to stand for Story Events. Located within the save file, users could find an entry for Story Events with various numbers located beneath it to determine a player's save progress. While the completion of Event 167 doesn't appear on a completed save file, there's nothing stopping a player from marking the event as completed. Adding Event 167 to the list and increasing the incremental length by 1 was all players needed to do. As for the BP True part, further investigations of the save file revealed an event called Bone Lord Puzzle Active, currently set to false. With a bit more save game editing to change the value to true, if a player was far enough into Act 1, when they tried to stand up from the table, the screen would begin to glitch out with the Bone Lord replacing Leshy, and the answer to the clue appearing at the top of the screen. For those that were able to see it, the revealed answer was, I am learned too much, giving everyone the first part of this new cipher. Now we have 23k2 f exclamation mark oor. The first part of this clue was recognized from one of the videos uploaded by Luke. On the bottom of this screen are these four notes. The first and fourth note may be a bit hard to see, but they're actually drawings of a pig's face, indicating a connection between the number 2 and a pig. For users that had been paying attention to the description of cards, it seemed to be that the two could be referring to the douse card. Despite many users thinking that the douse is a rat, its description mentions that it is actually a feral hog. Furthermore, other users had been looking more into the card game Carnoffle after it was mentioned in the Hollow Pelts data. And on one of the first websites when searching this game, ParletGames.uk, the community saw a very familiar looking image. A picture of the douse representing a 2 and an old pack of Carnoffle cards. So now we know that the 2s in this sequence are connected to the douse. This would lead players to speculate that they would need to recreate this 2-3-K-2 sequence in-game, specifically in the first area, as the douse isn't playable in the second act, and the third act uses five lanes. But now they needed to find out what the 3 and the K were meant to be. The K appears to be rather obvious. If we're going by Carnoffle cards, then the K would be a king, suggesting that it would be represented by one of the only cards in Inscription mentioning a king, the Rat King. As for the three, this would take a little bit more guesswork and may have been data mined. Plenty of cards in game have some connection to the number three. The Amalgam has three attack and health, Grizzlies have three blood cost, the Strange Larva has three transformations, but one of the more unique cards that would solve this puzzle was the Mantis God, for being the only card capable of hitting three lanes. With a bit of luck and testing, when all four of these cards are played on the same board in sequence, a single word appears at the top of them. Stop. While the first part of this clue was solved, there was still the second piece to figure out. Floor, or four, depending on how you want to view it. Looking back at the video from Luke with the sticky notes, there's another note at the top left corner of his computer monitor that provided people with a hint. This time, the note reads Mirror with the word Rorim written underneath it. It was speculated based on this that our clue needed to be reversed. Ignoring the exclamation mark, mirroring the letters we have, we go from four to roof. There's only one area in the game heavily featuring a roof that we can see, and that's Leshy's cabin in Act 2. In order to find the numbers needed, users looked at the number of missing planks on both sides of the roof. The left half gives us a 4, and the right half gives us a 1. 
Combine that with the numbers next to the roof from floor, spelt with the exclamation mark, our final code comes out to STOP27341. Interestingly, this solution for the second half was obtained by complete coincidence. The intended solution that Mullins would later reveal to Fleminate after his own recap of the ARG was that he needed to look at the floor texture files. And once Fleminade began looking at the floors across each act of the game, he'd find the cipher numbers hidden in the order of the acts. So it seems like everyone just kind of got lucky that the numbers Mullins had chosen for the cipher happened to match up with the numbers on the ground and the missing planks on the roof. The last clue of Archive New Game for this cipher was much more straightforward for those who could understand it. Examining the Archivist boss from Act 3, some users noticed that the beeps in the background music didn't appear to be random, but sounded more like Morse code. And when these sounds were transcribed, they spelt out the words Big Ear. The new game part of this clue had a similar solution, requiring players to examine the new game button in Act 1 or 3 for the noises and flashes of light it creates. For this other Morse code sequence, we get no chance. Plugging both of these back into our original cipher sequence, we get big ear, dollar sign, no, hashtag, chance, question mark. Once again going back to the console from before to update the log using our ciphers, this time the log reads the following. And for those who can't read Polish, here's a translation. This time the text talks about encryption and the danger of whatever was on the disk big ear had going missing. It also seems that this disc was obtained in Russia, and that the company Gamefuna is some sort of cover for a Cold War intelligence operation. Just like before, we also have more text inside brackets for our next cipher. This time they read, Back to beginning, Manatee, hashtag, hashtag, and Birchkin, dollar sign, dollar sign, 56-57M. With more clues obtained, the community was back to solving puzzles. For back to beginning, ideas were initially thrown around as to whether this could be referring to the beginning of the game, the beginning of Casey's story, the beginning of an act, or something else. But it was quickly discovered that this clue seemed to be directing players towards the literal beginning of inscription as a game. If you weren't aware, the concept for inscription was initially made as an entry for Ludum Dare 43 a game jam in which developers attempt to create a game centered around a given theme in 72 hours. Ludum Dare 43's theme was Sacrifices Must Be Made, which fittingly, Inscription's original version designed for this competition was given the same name as the theme. While the simplified version of the gameplay still seemed to be the same, what some users had noticed was that around the time Inscription's full version was released, Sacrifices Must Be Made's original version was quietly given an update. And upon looking into what this update was about, the community discovered that the game now required a file called cipher.cipher to unlock a hidden message. This was another callback to the ARG for the hex, where for one of its mysteries, players needed to create a text file with the correct cipher inside before placing it in the game's folder and renaming it to cipher.cipher. So players began doing something similar with Sacrifices Must Be Made, and after trying a few combinations, inputting the second fully answered cipher from our two sets of clues provided results. Beating the game now gave everyone an extra set of special dialogue that served as an answer. What lies ahead? Looking back at the previous card games made by Mullins was something of a theme for this set of clues. Players were actually given a small hint to solve the manatee hashtag hashtag clue, when around this time, two users from Discord paid a visit to the coordinates in game where Luke originally found the inscription floppy disk. After a short prank coordinated with Mullins, in which the users appeared to be attacked while live streaming their search, they managed to dig up a red floppy disk, although they were also given a black floppy disk by Mullins as the red one contained no data due to the likelihood of it being damaged from spending months in the dirt. After acquiring a floppy disk reader and checking the contents of the disk, 
A single text file was found that contained what appeared to be a username of This Guy Moaned. This was known to be a Reddit account owned by Mullins, but this drove users to take a second look at its posts. One post in particular would stand out, mentioning a card called Manatee Antony for a custom smash-up set made by Mullins called Aqua Romans. Mentions of Aqua Romans are scattered throughout inscription, and Manatee Antony seemed to be the hint that everyone was looking for but it would take a bit more guesswork from the community to discover that they needed to replace Manatee with Antony, while filling in the missing extra letter with another hashtag, giving the community the final answer of Antony with three hashtags at the end. Now we come to Birchkin $56-57M. This one was also correctly guessed to be two separate parts combined into a single answer, the first half of Birchkin once again led players to another of Mullen's older card games called Catch Monsters, where they found the Birchkin card. This one had also been hinted at during one of Luke's videos where he opens the Birchkin in a pack of cards. The Birchkin is unique for being the only card with the ability Pacifism, and given that Birchkin and Pacifism have the same number of letters, it was figured out that Pacifism was likely the first half of the clue. As for the 56-57M part, this stood out to users who were familiar with the Hexes ARG. In the hunt for that game's secrets, users had to play a game called Beneath the Surface, located on Steam. This game is pretty simple. You're an arctic fisherman that casts their rod beneath the surface of the ice and pulls up various items and fish. For the Hex, users had to fish up a locket with a description that appears to be a random string of numbers and letters but if someone had the correct cipher.cipher .cipher file, the description would be decoded. Something similar it appeared would be required for inscription, and sure enough, users found that they could fish up a strange disk at a depth between 56 and 57 meters with an encoded description. The previous cipher wouldn't work here, but after a few tests with the other clue ciphers people had found, the answers for the first set of clues proved to be the correct cipher this time. Decrypting the description reads, who knows what secrets are inscribed upon it, with some of the letters in the text being replaced. Pulling out the odd letters and numbers here, users got 0044 exclamation mark 3. Combining this with pacifism and the two dollar signs dividing them, users would receive their answer to this clue. Everyone was familiar with what to do at this point. Back to the console, input the info, update the log, and receive more information. This time we learned that the Carnoffel code had some sort of relation to the order of the cards in a Carnoffel deck found on Hitler's body. This code was copied to a floppy disk before being smuggled out of the Soviet Union by Wilkinson, but going off of info from previous cipher messages, it seems that the disk was lost among other blank disks while being transferred out of the country. Now unlike previous cipher entry reveals, this one doesn't contain the usual set of clues for another cipher. Instead, players received a link to an order form on a website that appeared to be owned by the agent Kaminsky mentioned in the story. People would begin to put in their addresses and information, and soon after the website was discovered, the order form was replaced with a message informing everyone to wait for their packages if they were ordered. Sometime later, three users would find themselves receiving a floppy disk in the mail. The first disk would be obtained by Discord user Uwawa, who streamed themselves opening the disk. Inside contained a single text file with the following contents. The first line reading QZ6H, surrounded by hashtags. The next line reading playing, that seemed to be part of another cipher. And two E's, that appeared to be part of two words with the rest of the letters missing. Going back to that first line, this was speculated to be part of a YouTube URL leading to a hidden video, but without the rest of the code, there was no way to figure this one out. Similarly, the second line didn't appear to be solvable either, given that it was only one part of a larger cipher. But based on the letter placement for the third line, people were able to correctly guess that the final line would spell out THE END. Going from there, this was actually enough for people to theorize that the final cipher was a thank you for playing message. Despite most people still waiting for the remaining discs to arrive that would presumably fill in the missing pieces, some users were able to work together to brute force an answer. 
finding that the correct cipher was, Thank you for playing Inscription, friend. And sure enough, once the final floppy disks arrived and were opened, it was confirmed that their contents were the missing pieces that were intended to be put together. Returning to the console one final time to input this cipher returns a message in Russian. Again, the translation is on screen. This final bit of text mostly just fills in a few extra details, confirming that the mystery of the old data goes back to World War II, and that it was Barry Wilkinson and Maxim Kaminsky who were responsible for finding the Karnoffel code. As for the YouTube URL, I'll include a link to it in the description, but just a quick audio warning if you decide to go watch it for yourself. The video displays a black screen for a bit before cutting to a slow zoom in of Luke's computer. We can see that it had been uploading inscription before being interrupted, like what happened in the story. But then the upload resumes and completes before an ASCII image of the stowed appears on screen and winks at the camera before the video ends leaving the story off with the implication that P03 actually succeeded. Now the main game ARG would come to a close at this point, but there are a few more pieces of story information I want to touch on before ending the video, and those are related to Casey's Mod and the Casey's Mod ARG. The Casey's Mod ARG was actually ongoing while I was working on this video, and so far it seems like it was just an additional fun event for the community to figure out, as development on Casey's mod concluded. And now that it's reached its end, it doesn't seem like it was too impactful on Inscription's main story. What does provide us with some more information, however, is the devlogs in Casey's mod. If you're unaware, Casey's mod is an addition made to Inscription post-launch to expand upon the first act's gameplay to give it more difficulty and replayability. Upon successfully completing runs, users can unlock devlog entries from Casey detailing her experience discovering the old data and the strange things going on in Inscription. First, it seems that Casey was just a regular employee at GameFuna and didn't have any connection to the intelligence operations going on at the company. She would witness the angler fish up a piece of the old data before giving it to Leshy, putting him in control of the game. From here, Casey began to work on what would become known as Casey's Mod, while learning more about the old data from Leshy and the Woodcarver. We also finally get another hint about what the Carnoffel code and the old data are used for, as Logs 7 and 10 mention a doomsday weapon located beneath Berlin, but Casey isn't sure if the Carnoffel code is used to arm or disarm this weapon, resulting in her making the decision not to destroy the disc. The final log is Casey stating that Kaminsky has recalled all of the floppy disks, but instead of turning it over, she decides she'll hide the disc in the woods and write down the coordinates of where she hid it to reclaim later. So let's recap what we learned from this ARG and the story. We know that the old data has some sort of connection to World War II and the Cold War. Utilizing a journal revealing the location of Hitler's body, Barry Wilkinson, also known as Big Ear, uses the order of a deck of Carnoffel cards found on the body to encrypt the Carnoffel code on a floppy disk. But upon trying to smuggle the old data out of the Soviet Union, the disk it's located on is lost in a box of blank disks. We now know that sometime later, the disk would find itself in the hands of GameFuna, a studio that seems to be both a legitimate game company with regular employees and a front for intelligence agents. Casey would be the one to find the disc while making an inscription video game, leading to her researching more into what the old data and Carnoffel code were, and their connection to a doomsday weapon located beneath Berlin. It seems that at some point it was discovered that Casey knew about the old data, leading to her being killed for this knowledge. But before this could happen, she would manage to hide the disc containing inscription and the old data in a box hidden in the woods leaving coordinates to its location inside a pack of cards. Luke would open the pack containing the coordinates, retrieve the disc, play the game, and would ultimately be killed for refusing to turn everything over to GameFuna. And that's where things are currently at. Casey's mod has still been receiving a few additional adjustments, but since the final log entries from Casey are filled in, it appears that the story for Inscription has come to a close for now. There are a few things I didn't quite get to touch on, such as the blue triangle mentioned at one of the holopelts, who Irving is, 
or beneath the surface representing the old data, given that many pieces of the story tie everything back to the hex. If you want to know more, I'd recommend looking into the ARG for the hex, although you can still get a good idea of what's going on in Inscription without that knowledge. As for what comes next regarding the Doomsday Weapon or P03 uploading itself remains unknown, but it's safe to say that the puzzles likely won't stop here, and it's only a matter of time until the community finds themselves on another hunt to solve the story of the Mullins first. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more gaming related videos in the future, remember to like and subscribe. Until next time, catch you next time.